Hi everybody, welcome. We're just about to get started on this evening's thinking. Um, we're really thrilled this evening to have with us uh, Lily Cole, who has frankly done more um, in her life than most of us put together will ever achieve. Um, I am going to hand over to our editor, James, who has just snuck in on time. But <laughs> while we're letting everybody into the room, if you want to be comfortable, get yourselves a drink and settle in for what's going to be a great hour. Brilliant. Tess, thank you so much. Uh, and uh, Lily, as uh, Tess says, I arrived literally on the wire there. Um, I noticed, yeah. <laughs> you'll, you'll have noticed. And uh, um, in the spirit of Who Cares Wins, um, I went to pick up Scout from the vet. Um, and uh, so I'm afraid she took a little longer to get home than uh, planned. But there and we Scout are. is your tortoise. No, 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 no. Scout no, no. is different. Scout is our Scout is our is our dog. Uh, okay. We've got a tortoise too. Uh, yeah, but yeah, I was hearing it. about it. <laughs> um, Lily, thank you so much for doing this, and thank you everyone um, for joining. What this means, of course, is that you know sometimes when you think that these kinds of events are all pre-cooked, that essentially Lily and I have had a pre-call and then we've spoken for half an hour in some cosy green room, <laughs> and then now what we're going to do is just trot out a set of rehearsed lines. Your advantage is this evening knowing that there's no such thing because Lily and I are saying hello. Right so when now. we fuck up, it's not fake. Yeah, no, no, that's <laughs> you know, By the way, then I can go off and you can do the safer hands and tears. Yeah. But, but, but listen, now the reason why we were really keen and excited actually, Lily, to to hear from you and talk about this book, Who Cares Wins, is because although I realize, you know, the, the thrust of it is really around how we change our lives to meet the challenge of climate change, actually what's really been, I think, one of the difficult balancing acts of the COVID-19 pandemic is trying to think through how much can we realistically have an appetite for fundamental changes in the way in which society, the economy, politics works, and how much do we need to get our heads down and realize we're looking at a massive health crisis and now a galloping economic crisis. And if you like, we all just need to get back to work. And so I wonder whether or not we could start. And I should say, by the way, if you've never been to a think in, the whole aim is it's not me talking to Lily. It's all of us talking to Lily. And if you like giving her ideas, uh, the, the a proper going over. We're going to try to kick the tires on them, test which ones work, understand uh, what we all think. So please put your thoughts to Lily, put them in the chat. Tess, whom you just met, is, is managing the chat this evening. Please do, um, you know, raise the thoughts and ideas that you've got. And if you've got counter ones, or if you've got ones that are built on the thoughts that uh, Lily's got, just weigh in. Because, as I said, one of the things that we've had as a developing theme at Tortoise but not yet nailed, if I'm honest, not yet actually managed to work out a way of telling that story, is how we live next. And mm. ask the question of how we live next. And it seems that's, that's the question that runs through your book, is the question you're asking is, whether it's around fashion or food or technology, the whole gamut, how, do we, how are we gonna live next? So why don't you, will you start really just by telling us a little about the premise for writing it? What propelled you to writing it? Because you've got a, platform being who you are that could do make your arguments on social media or make your arguments in traditional media why did you want to sit down and write a book i um i was i mean it's a very boring answer but i was asked by penguin oh i don't like i can see my face now as i talk but someone else's face is big um, i um was asked by penguin to write about a project that i'd worked on that was around the gift economy and um, I started writing that book on, on that premise um, because I'd been doing a lot of work for quite a few years on this platform that was trying to build a gift economy and I'd done a lot of research and I thought it was worth trying to kind of communicate that. And then when I started the process of writing that, I kind of very quickly realized that it probably didn't warrant its own book, that there are actually already quite a few good books written on the gift economy. And that instead what I was more interested in was looking at the gift economy as one of a number of tools and ideas that I think have the capacity to be quite game changing, mm -hmm. um, both socially and environmentally. And over the last kind of 15 or so years that I've been um, working on different kind of ideas and whether it's with NGOs or businesses and social businesses, um, I've, I feel like I've been afforded um, 
different kind of experiences of meeting different people and working with different projects. Um, and I've been afforded kind of maybe a, a, a view of, of, different, of, idea, of different ideas that I've got excited about. And I felt it was worth championing and um, kind of trying to maybe bring in some attention to some, you know, some better known than others. Um, and so instead I represented an idea to Penguin of kind of reasons for optimism of what are the different reasons that make me optimistic that I think that we can change things in a positive way if we want to. And one of the one things I should say that I really liked is when I started the book, I thought, oh no, this is going to sort of set out. Here are all the ways that we can live better. And actually one of the things I really liked about the book was all the way through you were talking about these trade-offs, that it was extremely unclear which was the right way to go and and even the virtuous were you know if you like in an argument with each other about which was more virtuous your organic farming or your um, non-meat eating your vegans and your vegetarians there's one trade-off that you talk about right at the start which I'd love you to sort of uh, begin with which is between wizards and prophets right you talk mm -hmm. about I think if I explain what you mean about the difference between wizards and prophets and then tell us where you think we've got to. Yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm using the terminology of a writer called Charles Mann, um, who wrote a book that's very good called The Wizard of the Prophet. Um, and, and I do think he's correct. I mean, of course, nothing's ever that simple, but I do think there is actually something quite truthful about that um, simplistic um, structure of understanding the debates that exist quite often within the environmental debate um, in terms of whether you take a kind of wizard-like technological approach to thinking about change and you feel like technology and innovation is going to solve our, are going to solve our problems um, or if you take kind of the profit-like approach and you think actually technology and innovation has gotten us into this mess for the most part and what we need to do is reduce simplify go back to kind of simpler ways of living and being and in all of the different areas I explore in the book from, you know, food to um, kind of carbon capture to fashion um, to politics, you, you often find people sitting on both sides of that fence. Um, and personally, I try not to take sides and I try and look at actually the, I think the kind of really strong arguments that exist in both camps, because probably we will need to have a bit of both actually in, in the way that we approach the problem. And, and, and what why don't you talk a little bit about fashion because I was really struck particularly I know that you open the book there and and quite sensibly so because people would say hang on a second here's Lily Cole she's trying to get us to rethink at the base level consumption and yet of course if you've been in the fashion industry you've been part of consumerism and now I suppose you're rethink not rethinking that but trying to address where the best consumerism now lies well, it was also the beginning of my journey, probably of thinking about these challenges, um, was, was the fact that I was working in fashion from a young age. I said when I was 14. And it's where I first started unpicking supply chains and just, I guess, considering the impact that the different businesses I was working with um, were having and seeing actually the capacity for business and supply chains and production to be both incredibly negative when done badly or actually conversely incredibly positive and the capacity for us to use business and trade as a tool for kind of solving problems if done in the right way. Mm -hmm. And so for me, that was kind of my way in and where I started focusing, but I always had in the back of my mind, fashion as just being a metaphor for everything else that I was looking at cotton or rubber or diamonds or whatever the different industries I was looking at because that was where I was working, but knowing that that same methodology and way of thinking was applicable to everything from food to, to the kind of cables we put in our phones. Um, and so obviously later in the book, I kind of then go into other sectors and some of the examples that I've worked in, but also other ones I've just been researching and studying. Have you, have you rethought in any fundamental way, shopping, consumption, fashion? Since when? Since, since you were a, a young model working in that industry to now being an author thinking, okay, we need to do something about the impact we're having on the planet. Has your, your attitude to retail changed? Yeah, I mean, massively. 
But I mean, that's probably true of everyone, no? Has yours not changed as you grow as an individual? Oh, actually, I think people are hoping mine will change. <laughs> I've got a different set of problems when it comes to, to shopping. But, 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 but oh, I'm curious tell us what are those. Um, so, but just well, I mean, I. Yeah. Oh, okay. I mean, I grew up, and I write about this in the book, um, I grew up in a pretty poor family where we didn't have much access to stuff. And as maybe, I don't know if that's why, or if that's just anecdotal, but I think it's probably got something to do with it. I was like desperate for stuff. And we live near Portobello Market. And I remember I was always trying to beg my mom to buy me one thing or another. And sometimes if I burst into tears loudly enough, the, the market vendor would just give it to me. Um, and I was always dressing up in, in those things or my mom's stuff or whatever. And so I think I had a real appetite for stuff when I was younger. Um, and interestingly, I think the combination of being saturated by stuff by virtue of working in fashion and just having so much exposure to, to clothes um, and things, making money and having then more access to stuff. And also that combined with the fact that I suddenly started understanding the real cost of making stuff um, mm. environmentally and socially has certainly changed my attitude. And now I still have way more stuff than I feel I need but I'm actually on the opposite trajectory of like trying to actually have less and less and being much, much more mindful of what I buy and knowing, knowing the impact of what I, what I buy and have. And, and do you, so, yeah, do you, it's completely changed in answer and, to your question. And do you, do you have a sort of set of, because one of the things that's, I think complicated about the book, but is complicated about reality is you set out some of these competing interests but it's hard to know at the end. Okay, well, how does Lily Cole shop? What, what's your what? What are your decisions when you when you shop? How do you weigh air miles versus you know local labour impacts? How do you consider the environmental costs versus the human ones? How do you think about those things when when you're buying stuff? Well, firstly, I'll just say I'm just giving you my examples and. I avoided being prescriptive in the book for a reason because I think these debates are really complex and so this is just my version of things I'm not saying it's the right version but my version is um, food I find relatively simple now um, we've actually been growing our own vegetables which is really fun but not enough to like live off <laughs> um, we have two local farms that are great and we get all of our most of our food from there um, and they're both organic um, I'm predominantly vegan i will occasionally have a bit of fish i'll occasionally have um eggs if i trust where they come from but i basically just try and avoid industrial animal agriculture and i feel really good and clear about that um in terms of clothes i don't really buy much anymore um i feel like i have enough i wear stuff that i've had forever and i try and fix it um i do if i'm buying stuff i quite like buying second hand um, for my daughter, I'd either buy her second hand or I quite like supporting um, like organic, you know, you, you do find quite a few kids clothes companies that focus on using organic and having fair trade um, principles. And so we'll try and support those. The ones, the things that I still feel quite sloppy around is um, like just like household stuff or like, I don't know, just the things that you need like last minute that you end up buying online quickly electronics stuff that's actually quite hard to um be more mindful around um that's probably the area that i think i still want to improve all right well i want to i want to bring a couple of people just on this consumerism point we're going to come i hope to tech and probably a little more on food and veganism and vegetarianism in a moment but just on the um on sort of what we consume and what we have an appetite to consume. I wanted to bring in Peter Flynn and then if I might, Debbie Allen, just because they were both talking about consuming less or having what you need close to home. Hello, Peter, good evening. What's your thinking on this? So I think that I am probably now more aware about, um, as a result of lockdown, more aware about my lack of need to consume. And I probably wasn't going into shops and buying lots of clothes and other bits and pieces I didn't want before the pandemic, but the lockdown has proved actually even if I wasn't before, I definitely don't need to. And so um, it's almost like a, a, a sort of conscious reset where I'm going, okay, in terms of bare essentials of what you need, uh, something, to, something to eat and um, be careful about what you eat and sort of, you know, you're aware of the supply chains. 
but it's also the sort of the you know all of the other things fast moving consumer goods clothing uh, the bits and pieces yes you can order online i suppose it also gives you a little bit more awareness to just how much you are now ordering online as well where where you've had this protracted period of seeing what you consume and it almost being sort of accountable because you're not so busy with everything else in life but peter what do you just out of interest on consuming less because I, I'm, a, I guess I'm aware of two things. One is I'm aware of what Lily's talking about and making what are, to a certain extent, you know, luxury choices in terms of the, you know, goods and products you buy. Because a lot of them are priced slightly higher or significantly higher than your mass market products. And the other one is a, a dent to consumption, which might sound good individually but en masse means that our economy might not nearly be as strong as before and that might have a big impact. And, and I just wonder how you think about that, Peter. You know, the sort of encouragement we're getting from politicians, which is go out and shop or go to the pub or go back to the work in the office and whether or not that has any pull on you at all. So uh, the, to the, the first question, I think more about the supply chain now, that the whole length of it and what happens way back upstream and is that ethical is it necessary um, I'm far more aware of that now for truth for various reasons the second point therein lies the conundrum um, we need to generate more and get the economy going whatever it is that's being produced it, it needs to be bought and traded uh, for that economy to thrive yet we're all now more aware that actually in terms of necessity for ourselves personally we probably need less Right. Interesting. Um, Debbie, Alan, are you there? Because you said something similar, that things are, things are, the things you want are closer to the things you need. Yes, that's right. Yes. Right. Hi. So um, I think it was really um, compounded by uh, the, the, the rush to stockpile in the beginning uh, that we saw in just sort of buying really basic um, food stuffs and realizing that actually we had so much food really already stored and just a bit of creativity and time enabled enabled us to be able to create some fantastic things and rather like lily was saying you know you can grow things it's so we were really lucky this pandemic happened in the spring so it actually made us yeah, quite so lucky in that regard um and um it's been so enjoyable and, and actually the the need and want being very close together has uh, expanded into other areas too in that um, you look in your wardrobe and you realize you don't need more clothes actually um, you're certainly not when you're not going to work so again you become creative I've discovered new ways to kind of work my wardrobe and I didn't want to be having packages arriving all the time from Amazon because again I had a an issue with that so um, so it's it's made me more thoughtful um, but I'm really grateful for it in that regard and I think uh, a number of, of people I know feel the same way. Debbie, Debbie thanks. I, 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 Lily do you want to talk about that about this question of how you rethink what what consuming, what buying things, what you shop for, what you eat um, means to you? Because there's an element in this which is, you know, is always really personal. Sorry, say the question though. Okay. What does it, what, what you buy and what you, because Debbie's point is actually an, an understanding of what these things that you acquire actually mean to you. Yeah. And whether that's changed too. Well, I mean, if I began by saying I used to love stuff when I was little, I guess that hasn't changed in the sense that actually the journey now is more about loving stuff more, right? Um, mm. Like buying stuff because you really love it and therefore you're going to really look after it and, and repair it and fix it and keep it and pass it on. Um, so it sounds less materialistic, but in a funny way, it's more materialistic because it's actually like deepening your relationship with things. Um, and can I, so, and forgive me for interrupting. Sorry, just... for, forgive me for interrupting. The, the, one of the questions that one of the questions that I've got. I've got two kids on a trampoline outside. Let me just <laughs> close the door. <laughs> um, one of the one of the questions that I've got is: All right, how much of that is realistic? How much of long-term changes in in public behaviour is is realistic to expect? Because I think the difficulty with 
planning to address climate on the basis of human behavior is all of the charts go in one direction and what reason is there to believe they're going to change well that's where politics is plays an important role right and i look in the book i, I spend you know a good part of the beginning of the book looking at conscious consumerism and how we as if we have the luxury of choice um as consumers how we can then think more mindfully about the types of businesses we want to operate because those businesses are shaping the world and creating or solving many of the problems we're dealing with through their supply chains and then i kind of flip the flip that narrative in its head to make the argument that actually it's a com it's a completely false economy we're operating in and it's really unfair on consumers to expect that individuals should be fixing these problems and have so much responsibility to understand everything they're buying and the impact of everything they're buying um, and also it's not really fair that environmentally it's not it's not fair it's just not even correct that environmentally friendly choices cost more because in reality they don't but what we're not doing is we're not factoring in negative externalities so the environmental and social costs of making things cheaply those costs do exist we're just kind of externalizing them for governments to pick up now or later um and that's where maybe like uh, i would argue that politics has a role to play in making these choices easier i like basically just raising the bottom but there's all right let, let's go at those two things we're going to go at them separately how we how we price what we value the understanding of what things are worth to us not just as consumers but as society seems to me to be a really good subject and then how we enable people to afford what they want that these are two two big subjects so let, let's start with the question of how we make sure that as a society we're we're pricing things for what they're worth i just had to bring in emma and um paul atherton who both separately have made really you know uh, pertinent points to this uh, emma why don't we start with you because you made the point directly that said these choices are a luxury far away no, um, yeah, no, I'm someone who's never had a terrific amount of money and luxury is a real choice for those who can afford to make it. I've, my wardrobe was predominantly from being a child to now at 43, been from charity shops. And down the years as somebody who's always regularly bought their clothes second hand, not for ethical reasons, but because it's all I could afford. Um, I found that A, the prices have increased because uh, charity shops started realizing that they could make more profit out of the goods that they were selling. And also that the amount of stock that they've been receiving has dropped as people who can afford to buy new clothes have made the choice not to shop for a certain amount of time and therefore have less stuff to donate. Um, and I think there is a, there's a class assumption. Uh, it, the other thing is that, so that I hadn't typed in was that how young working class women predominantly get mocked for buying fast fashion but they can't afford to make different choices. And there's a real choice absolutely is a luxury. And I would love to be able to make more ethical choices in a lot of the things I buy. I don't have the luxury of making that choice. Mm. And because all my shopping was secondhand and it was easy because it was available and it was cheap, I've really noticed in the last few years that that's becoming harder for me to do because you know, not buying anything new for a year means that you're not giving away anything for a year. So there's less stock. Um, and I just wondered, I just kind of wanted to make that point and kind of see what other people may or may not think. It's, Emma, it's, it's just out of interest though, because for example, I went about four weeks ago, just after things opened in mm -hmm. retail, I took a cycle ride around London and it was really, really striking that for all the newspaper front pages that had pictures of people queuing actually the shops were completely empty with two exceptions Primark and TK Maxx there were queues outside both of them and so the, the interesting thing is it's not just the question of, of second-hand shops it's actually the the approach to these uh, environmental impacts labor labor impacts of those really really low-cost um, yeah. retailers and I just wondered when you say you've always bought from secondhand shops, have you not also then said, actually, I'll go to Primark because this, the I, prices are so good? Especially for my son, because as my son has grown, it's, um, you know, they get to a certain age and it becomes really hard to buy secondhand clothes. He's a teenager. In the process of lockdown, he grew about an inch and a half, which is enough to have outgrown all of his clothes. Right. About the only places I can buy cheap clothes for him are supermarkets right. and Primark. 
um, yeah. because I've not gone out, I've ordered from supermarkets because their clothing ranges are affordable and had them delivered. Yeah. But yes, there, there is that, you know, and that, that mocking of people queuing for Primark was like, well, actually, over the course of lockdown, if you've got children, they've probably grown a size. Yeah. And where else are you going to buy affordable clothing for them when yeah. they're going to keep growing? So, yeah, absolutely. I think that's that's a, 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 a part of it, too. I mean, it was really just, to, to, you know, it was really interesting when we started looking at one of the questions that Lily touches on in depth in the book, which is about what we eat. We talked at some length to the senior management of Tesco. And they said, look, if you want to start thinking about how we eat next and responsible eating and you're thinking about civil rights and you're thinking about environment and you're thinking about obesity, you're going to fall into a classic middle class, upper middle class trap of forgetting to talk about affordability. And these are, uh, and this is, I think, I mean, it's, I'm going to come back to you in a second, Lily, because this seems to be a key question that, that, that if you like, hovers above everything that you're saying in the book, which is how do you make this work on mass, the new, these new criteria work on mass. But I just want to, in the same spirit, bring in Paul Atherton, because Paul's making a similar point actually about goods and services. Are you there, Paul? Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, far away. Yeah, so I mean, you know, one of the issues I have being homeless is often uh, it is cheaper to buy an entire wardrobe of five t-shirts, five pairs of underwear, five socks, a pair of jeans, than it is actually to put a, a service wash through a laundrette in Soho, which is a, a ridiculous stance to be, because you'd think, well, surely the cost of manufacture would surpass the ability to launder your own clothes. Um, and I think the thing you mentioned about food, it was, it, it's always intrigued me being a, a Valley's boy. When we were growing up, there was something called food. Um, and that food then got relabeled organic food because industrial farming with the likes of Tesco's kind of took over and actually the cost of production wasn't that different. The, there was a loss in terms of you know not spraying your goods with uh, insecticide but because it was it was small batch losses it wasn't a huge loss so that the cost of the goods would have been the same had we not had the industrial farming of the likes of Tesco's which then decimated the very small outlets that we used to shop in at affordable prices and replaced it with this sort of mass consumerism. And I, I, one of the big things for me about food, I think the, the thing you mentioned about Tesco's, is uh, while I've been in this emergency hotel accommodation, I've been gifted this sort of 70 pound a week M&S gift voucher. And the first thing you notice when you go into M&S is a wall full of herbs. The first thing you notice when you go into a Tesco's is a wall full of Pringles. And it really does impact hugely, A, on your psychology, but B, on the ability to find things. And there's also a misconception as well. People often think, for instance, that Marks and Spencer's is more expensive than, say, Tesco's. And actually, when the small sort of Tesco locals are in play, they invariably way, way more expensive for the equivalent of produce in Marks and Spencer's. A classic that example of being buying a single banana in Tesco's will cost you 50p, buying three or four in loose from Marks and Spencer's will cost you 30. Is that right? I will go, I mean, Paul, I'll go, and, I'll go and check both those things because I suppose the only thing I would say is that I think Tesco would make the point that actually overall, it's been able to supply a, a much, much wider range of food at a much lower cost to many more people than all of those independent shops. And I think they'd also say, on a price comparison, they would compare enormously favorably to M&S. But if it's one of those things where that's the common perception and the reality is different, we'll, we'll look into it. But that, that would be my, my, my starting assumption. Yeah, well, I, I think you know, what, one of the, the, the interesting issues is that, um, you know, for instance, Marks and Spencer's have a lot, lot, lot more fresh food. Yeah. Um, so, you know, even from a price point just directly, is that Tesco's will sell a single banana as a single banana, uh, but you will be able to buy it as a loose banana and therefore buy weights, not by item. And this mm. is where the big differences are. Oh, really? Okay. Well, I will look at that. But, but Lily, can, you, can, can we come back to this question about whether or not the agenda that you're exploring, right, an agenda which is, uh, you know, conscious consumerism, uh, an agenda around... Uh, a, a more vegetarian based, a more plant based diet, um, possibly even a vegan diet, um, and, and the impacts of meat consumption, that a lot of these things 
um, end up being marginal, not marginal partly for social and political reasons, but primarily for economic ones. And, mm. and how would you change that? Well, firstly, I would say that um, I think you're completely right with the exception of food, because actually, um, at least with meat, because actually there's lots of data that shows that eating less meat, having a predominantly vegetarian or vegan diet is generally cheaper. Um, uh, so I don't think that's an economic problem so much. Um, but I do think there are massive kind of cultural issues there and um, access issues. I'm not saying it's an easy one. It's, it's um, cheap. I think the argument, just to be clear, I think the argument around vegetarianism and certainly veganism is not around the cost of the ingredients, but it's for people who are time poor, finding the time to prepare those foods and that perhaps they're not enough pre-prepared foods like that, but they're finding enough time for, to prepare those foods suggests a certain amount of time that many people don't have. I don't, honestly don't think that's that. true of, I think veganism maybe I could understand because veganism is like, um, is harder. I don't think it's that hard, but it is a bit harder. I think there's so many vegetarian options now that, um, that it's actually very easy. It's mm -hmm. easy to be vegetarian as it is to eat, eat meat nowadays. And I say as somebody who's been predominantly vegetarian since I was 10, so I've had 22 years of testing this market, it's pretty easy nowadays. Um, but I think that in terms of many of these other areas we're talking about, whether it's organic food or clothes, um, yeah, it's a massive problem. And as I mentioned, I grew up in a family that didn't have, didn't have much money, so I'm like I'm not at all blind for that and I talk about in the book the fact that when I was a teenager like probably like 12 maybe so preteen um that a Primark opened in um in the neighborhood near us and I remember it was just amazing mm. because I it was like I couldn't believe it I couldn't believe the access suddenly that I had um to buying things and I didn't for a second question that or quite like question what that meant um and I don't blame people for not questioning it now but having worked in the industry and researched and kind of traveled the world and seen what the actual impacts are of different supply chains, I'm now much more aware that there are really hard costs to those things mm -hmm. and those costs will be paid. So the idea that we can get away with not paying them, anybody, I'm not talking about whether you're rich or you're poor, that like as a society, we can get away with not paying them is just really a false economy because we will pay those costs. Mm -hmm. um, We'll pay them in our social services, we'll pay them in our environmental kind of cleaning up and mm -hmm. that those costs will be paid. So it's, it's a really difficult conversation to have. I'm not saying there are easy answers. I think things like charity shops do offer, um, offer good solutions. Um, you know, it's interesting that my mum, who grew up with no money in a mountain in the south of Wales, like she, they had no money. It's because they had so little money, they therefore, they, she came to London and she handmade her own clothes. And they would, if you got a coat, you would re reuse your coat for 10, 20 years. You just had a completely different attitude to things. I'm not saying everyone needs to do that, but I think it's also like a, a, mindset, sh a mind, mindset shift mm. around, um, yeah, how we look after things, how often we buy, and maybe paying more if you can with a view to buying less and making things last longer. Can, can we, Billy, can we talk a bit, uh, there are a number of people who've been talking about apps and how apps are changing their lives and the impact of tech on their consumerism and responsible consumerism. Um, I'm going to bring them in a, in a moment, if I might. I'm interested to hear from Robert Tansy and, and uh, there's someone called Emma, I don't see the surname. But before we get there, why don't you talk through the section in your book on technology? Because I was really intrigued by it as, you know, you, you're obviously a creature of that of of the technology age and so much of the reach that you've had and the influence that you've had has been through the new technologies and yet you obviously come to this point where you're quite skeptical suspicious worried by it and i just wanted you to talk to people about you know how you think we should handle tech um interesting you see my reach has been going through technology i feel like my Oh, my main part of my career was pre pre social print. media and stuff. So actually, I was in the old fashioned days of print, having print to bags. man, yeah, man handle the media without having that direct voice. Um, in terms of our relationship to technology, I mean, I set up a technology company um, about seven eight years ago, and that's how I got into technology. And um, when I did that, I was incredibly excited and kind of tech utopian about what I thought technology could do that's you know it gave us the capacity to build platforms and connect in new ways and 
um, be essentially quite disruptive, um, which it has been. And I think from both working in technology, but also just watching the way that that industry is evolving in recent years, I have become much, much more concerned um, talking really about digital technology and what we've seen in the last 30 years since the internet was invented 31 years ago, I think. Um, I think that it's actually like remembering that the internet is that new, you know, 31 years in the history of mankind is a, it's not even a blink of an eye. It's probably like a <laughs> milli, milli, milli blink of an eye. And um, it's had a hugely transformative effect on our lives, but it is really young. And I think we have to be quite mindful about how it's being designed and, you know, the, the structures that's, that, um, that exist within technology so that we use it in the best possible way. And, and, and when you say that, and I think everyone would agree with that, the question is then, all right, so who's going to design it? Who's going, who's going to oversee technology? Do you think that the market of innovation is going to make those decisions? Or do you think that you're going to have to have regulation for outcomes by technology companies? Well, it's an interesting question, because if you think about the original iteration of the Internet from Tim Berners-Lee, it was a completely decentralized proposition. I mean, he exactly. gave the technology away, the idea away, royalty free, um, hence it grew to what it became today. And I think that kind of open source grassroots vision of the internet, which still to an extent exists, you know, you've got, I think a quarter of websites are built um, through open source technology, WordPress. Um, we've got Wikipedia as the fifth biggest website in the world. You know, you have got some really amazing examples still exist, still in existence of, that spirit of the internet in a very decentralized way where power is very distributed. Um, but we have gone in a direction where there are a handful of monopolies of corporations that are now running the internet and that have more money and power than many countries in this world. Um, and that power is arguably becoming more and more consolidated because there has been very little regulation around the ability of those companies to buy up competition. Um, and so I do think we probably reached a moment where we do need to think about um, politics role and regulation. I was quite interested to see um, Elizabeth Warren last year, you know, when she was trying to take on big tech. And I think we're likely to see maybe more kind of political challenges of technology because it's becoming apparent that these companies are becoming so powerful, they're actually potentially influencing politics. So what, and what would you and what would you do, Lily? Would you say, OK, let's break up Facebook. Let's um, make an argument we should break up Google. Let's potentially even break up Apple, too. Um, I, I think I'm probably pretty sympathetic to Chris Hughes's argument, the Facebook co-founder, that Facebook should be broken up, that the ability of Facebook to buy WhatsApp and Instagram shouldn't have been allowed because it has essentially created a massive monopoly and that you've seen antitrust lawsuits in other industries equivalent to um, and that in Chris Hughes makes seem it's worth looking up if you haven't seen it he wrote an article for the New York Times about a year ago yeah. making the case that Facebook should be broken up that's worth reading and his argument is that it's in a way the illusion of freedom that created that situation because these platforms are free to the users they weren't regulated in the same way because we thought that they were in the consumer's interest yeah. um, but actually they're not, of course they're not free, like nothing is free, right? So what are we actually paying with? Um, and what are the impacts of the things that we're paying with for these platforms? Um, so yeah, Apple, I don't, I haven't really analyzed in the same way to have an opinion on, um, what was the one, the other one you asked me, sorry, Google. Google, but they're all, they're all similar principles about, you know, market dominance, um, you know, and, and power in the marketplace. Let me, let me bring in Robert Tanzi. And I said, sorry, I, I said Emma, but actually, of course, I meant Marie Claire, um, who, who both made points about um, tech. Robert, why didn't you just, you, you mentioned, I think, an app in the chat that I'd not heard of, but I probably should have That's right, yeah. Um, so it's an app called Geeky, and it's, uh, it works off two main insights. Number one, that there's a whole bunch of people out there who want to live more sustainably, but are just confused and don't know what to do. Uh, and the second one being that, actually for the majority, most people are not absolutists, i.e. They, they are not prepared to be, live sustainably in every single aspect of their lives because that for them is just not practical. So the original version of the app actually took all the data from the barcodes in every single product in the most, most of UK supermarkets. And you went in and you scanned that product and up on the app came its scores on various environmental criteria such as has it got palm oil? Is it organic? How many food miles has it got? And gave you a sort of relative score 
for each of those things. And if you decided that didn't meet with the things that were important to you, it would then suggest another product in the same supermarket that you could go and buy. Wow. So really simple. I mean, on the one hand, a bit laborious because you have to scan every product that you buy, but very simple decision-making criteria for you as the user. The new app, which I think is live, the website's live, I'm not sure if the app is yet, it's called Geeky Zero, and it applies the same principle, but to how do you reduce your carbon footprint? So what you do is you answer a series of questions which helps uh, the app understand your priorities or your practicalities in life. So for instance, it may not be practical for you to stop flying because you need to go a lot for your business in the pre-COVID world, obviously, but you may want to be very keen to not use your car very much or not use plastic. Uh, and so then suggest these, these certain simple actions that you can do to reduce your carbon footprint in the areas of your life where you are prepared to make those steps. It's really interesting. And, and, and so Robert, so it's really interesting. The, my first question is, yep. there's, a, there's an individual choice thing there that's very exciting i can go and scan it and learn presumably not just get got classic price comparison but outcome comparisons yeah, exactly there's there's a, there's a second order question which would be well if all of that data is there and if the producers either consumer goods companies or supermarkets have access to that same data then to a bit to paul atherton's point you could rather, you know, beyond just herbs versus Pringles, you could actually be creating a hierarchy in shelves and in websites that are around overall impacts of products. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. In the, and, and, and so I guess the, my question is, Geeky, yeah. how confident are you in the way in which they measure the, the impact of what we're buying? Uh, not entirely sure I understand the question. So my point, is, my point is, okay, let's say, for example, I go in the shop yeah, and I've decided I'm going to buy some gala apples, right? Yeah. And the Granny Smiths next to them are next to them and priced there about the same. Who, who are geeky to tell me what the, what the inputs are so that I've got some confidence in what the outcomes are? Uh, no, no. It's, so the, 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 all the information is derived from that. It's amazing. All that information is held within the barcode. Of the, you, the, the, the back end. The supplier data, of the apples has to have told. Correct. Yes. I all see. all okay. that stuff is in there. So it's, it's existing data, but it's just, it's just invisible to most people. Oh, wow. Okay. So that's, that's, the, really, that's the really clever bit. Okay. All right. Well, we'll go and have a, we'll, as you can imagine, go and have a look. Sorry, Mary Claire, I'll um, um, ask you to weigh in because you were, touching on, upon a similar thing. Hello. Hi there. Hello. No, it was just interesting because you're also talking about tech and the way in which we, we consume and the impact that's had. Yeah, well, I, um, I never actually specialised in technology. I've always been in the arts, but I became, over the last five years, more involved in gender diversity and working with young girls and exposing them to technology careers. Um, and the idea behind that, of course, was to try and increase the diversity in, in creating applications and businesses and so on. Um, and what we found is that a lot of the girls are more inspired once they see what the meaning is behind what they're doing. So when they're working with startups that work, for example, um, with blind people, or they're working with startups that work within the circular economy, um, that, that captures their interest and then they become more interested in tech. Um, so I, I guess from my perspective, um, I'm very much with Lily on this in terms of the, the big, um, I call them the sort of the, the feudal lords, and that would include the pharmaceutical companies and oil companies and so on but the sort of the feudal system where companies are now running the world um, I'm all for disruptive startups and I think we need not just gender diversity in that of course but we need all other areas of diversity to create those those elements of technology and then we can be more conscious about how we utilize technology uh, for the good rather than for the bad. Mm -hmm. Lily do you want to talk about that a bit because it also obviously comes up in the book how you actually marshal technology for good. Does it come up in the book? <laughs> um, I don't know if I actually like give prescriptive answers. I mean, the original vision of technology as a decentralized open source um, kind of structure that empowers people, as I might have already mentioned, I'm a big fan of and would love to see more Wikipedia-esque um, companies in the world. 
Um, in the meantime, I do think regulation was helpful. And I think it's just being more mindful, you know, of just instead of, I feel like it's become so dominant technology that we just almost, like we always just kind of like assume it's like as real as money, which is also obviously made up. <laughs> These things become so normalized, they feel like as real as a tree or a lake. Um, but actually it's obviously a human invention and it's a very relatively new one and there needs to be more kind of mindful dialogue about how we consume it and how we use it. And I think especially maybe, and that's a big bit I was looking at in the book in terms of digital around the, the concept of free and what does it mean that all of these services are being given to us for free, um, how are we actually paying? Because of course they're, you know, trillion dollar, billion dollar companies that cost a fortune to run and there are, um, there are ways we are paying. Well, what do you what do you say to people? Because some people will come to the end of your book, and say, "Okay, that's right. I I basically agree with the analysis of the problem. Right? Who's going to who's going to argue against climate, and who's going to argue against inequality and unfairness of personal outcomes? But I don't agree with the rather measured." set of answers or set of approaches you come up with we need to have a much more profound radicalism that deals with these problems so yes there is money money is an organizing tool but let's use that organizing tool differently so let's put in you know different kinds of pay gap reporting so we deal with unfairness you do talk about carbon taxes let's put those in make them mandatory let's change the way in which government works so that it's much more local i just wonder the extent to which having written the book you know a lot of people know that feeling of having sat down press send on a piece that they're writing or an email they're sending and then two days later thought you know what i should have gone further how much do you think of that I don't think that at all. And actually, if anything, <laughs> if anything, I think that people might read the book, it depends who they are, like, and think it's actually quite radical because a lot of the ideas I'm championing, like universal basic income, I talk about wealth taxes, I talk about um, carbon, you know, I spent almost a whole chapter talking about pollution taxes. Um, some of these ideas actually, weirdly now, seem to be much more palatable post-COVID and yeah. discussed yeah. in the mainstream but when I was writing it a year ago, it was still considered radical ideas. What I think I've done, and I, and I don't um, regret at all, is not, um, is not really being ideological and saying like, this is the one thing that we have to do tomorrow and this is it. Right. Um, because I think that's super dangerous. And I think we're, one of the biggest concerns I have is that we're in a world where lots of people are doing that. Mm. And we're all spending our energy and fighting about the right way to do things and the better way to do things. And actually what we really need is to actually be open-minded and listen to each other and look at data and pilot things and experiment and be brave enough to test new ideas, but be like humble enough to not assume that we know the answers mm -hmm. at the get go. Um, and so, yeah, I think the point of the book is about, is about being measured and about dialogue, like mm -hmm. that actually the dialogue is going to be an essential key to solving a problem that affects every single person on this planet. I think I was thinking about talking to you today and thinking to myself, how different would I be if I was talking to you and it was just a handful of us sitting around a table having a meal rather than sort of this kind of environment where there are lots of people listening to you. And I thought there was something I'd probably ask you privately and then thought, actually, I should ask you publicly anyway, which was about how you thought about celebrity and fame and the role of being famous and sort of entering into the public square on big subjects of public policy. Because, you know, of course, there's one thing to be asked by Penguin. There's another thing to say, as you know, I do want to write that book. I'd like to weigh in on the public debate. And how do you think about that? What's, what's your role there? What, what are the limits of your influence or authority? And what are your, what's the extent of your powers as someone who's well known it's probably hard for me to be objective about but um firstly i like shiver if i hear the word celebrity <laughs> um a famous I, person i said um i also say celebrity sorry i did you're right i mean i i, I mind i I'm, I'm aware of the fact that the fact that i have a public um or have had a public profile in the past in the UK particularly has given me um, a certain platform to the me access to the media and kind of maybe a bigger platform than I might ordinarily. Um, so I'm not blind to that. 
at the same time, I don't believe I would have been asked to write this book and I certainly wouldn't have written it if I hadn't spent most of my kind of working life much more invisibly working on kind of different entrepreneurial projects or on technology projects or um, the gift economy idea or um, with different NGOs because it's all of that work really that's gone into the thinking and the research that's in the book. Um, so I guess maybe I get, I don't know what's the answer. I think I'm not writing it because I'm known, but the fact that I'm known hopefully might bring it to a slightly different audience. Sorry. My Hello. What about this question? Because one of the things that's really struck me is that in the course of the coronavirus and the course of the pandemic, actually one of the things you've seen is that media is much less with Bye. <laughs> Bye. But is much less media is much less influential. <laughs> Right. Actually, if you think about it, if you're an actor or a writer or a director, you know, that world, you know, is wonderful when you switch on Netflix. But actually, in dealing with a pandemic, in thinking about a um, recession with mass unemployment, you need lawmakers and leaders and people who make rules. And I wonder whether or not we, we had a big file last week from Alistair Campbell, who was talking about having seen what he thought should be happening, then realizing his frustration that he had little influence or power over it. How much now that you sort of set out what you think, particularly as you say around things like pollution taxes and carbon taxes. Oh, I think I have very little influence. Pardon? I think I have very little influence. No, that's what I'm saying. How do yes, you feel yeah. then about that? Do you think, but, oh, I need to weigh in? What are the systems that you actually get some of this done? I think I personally have very little influence in that sense. But I think that ideas are really powerful and ideas change the world and stories change the world. And so sharing ideas, it's not really about me. I mean, I, I put some of my own personal anecdotes in it because that's my life story and maybe it's a bit more interesting. But really the point of the book is looking at, at like ideas and um, proposals and those have the capacity to really have an influence and um, whether people learn about them because of my book or because of right. a newspaper article or something else or this conversation, um, it's sort of irrelevant. The more important thing is that ideas will change the world. And so which ideas do we want to focus on? No, no, but I'm asking, I'm asking you whether or not having had these ideas and actually it's no, small... I'm just saying, no, 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 I no, no, I get that. No, what I'm, <laughs> saying is, I'm not saying you're the inventor of these ideas. What I'm saying is once you've articulated what you think should happen in the world, there's a moment where you think, right, well now how am I going to make that happen? So what I'm asking you is how do you go from being an activist in ideas to an activist in outcomes? Well, I guess it's about having a conversation, right? And writing a book is part of having a conversation and doesn't mean that every conversation you're gonna win for want of a better word or like get the outcomes, but you are having a collective conversation and, and there is a collective conversation that really needs to happen. We are in, we're facing a massive crisis, like unbelievable. If you look at the data around climate change, it is terrifying, ter absolutely terrifying. James, I saw you in Davos earlier this year I was there with the climate scientists and yeah. they're almost in tears because they've spent decades trying to give this information to the, to the people who are seemingly running the world and not enough is changing and the stakes are getting higher and they're really scared. And then you have a group of teenagers like Greta Thunberg and the other youth activists who were there with her that week who were also like nearly in tears because they're like, why are the adults not listening to the scientists? Yeah. Like it doesn't make any sense. So we had, I think, a taster of what crisis looks like this year with COVID which incidentally most scientists agree is, a, is also a consequence of humans relationship with the natural world and the animal species. So we have to have these conversations yeah. and all I'm trying to do is bring kind of my experience and my knowledge and my thoughts to the conversation. How impactful that'll be is it sort of, I'm not saying it's irrelevant, but it is sort of irrelevant from my perspective. I just have to feel like I'm trying my little bit to like be part of a conversation around solutions because that conversation really needs to happen. Okay, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring in one final thought from Bex, Cotty, if, if you're there, Bex. Are you, have, you, have you got, um, can we hear you, see you? I was just interested in your point, hello there. I was just interested in your point about how you shift consumerism and how you shift its priorities. Um, I think the, the thoughts that I was having about that and, and the conversations I've had about it with people in the past has been about, um, we we based our economy predominantly on on service economy and consumerism 
And it's time that we change that focus to being back about our environment, both for our own physical and mental well-being, but also for the environment. If we made the environment part of our economy, then it would give us a, a financial reason to protect it. Mm. Um, yeah. So, and and you know, we we've, we've heard in the last few weeks about the build, 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 but who wants that building to happen in their backyard? No one. Uh, who who wants that building to be the new builds that we have, which are actually some of the poorest quality new builds that in Europe? Um, we need to be thinking about uh, renovating. Um, you can probably see behind me, I live in rather a <laughs> grossy house at the moment. <laughs> we're hoping to renovate and repurpose buildings. And if we're moving away from the town centre shopping model, then we're going to have huge swathes of, of property that needs repurposing, which means that we don't then have to start using green belt land, um, and gives everybody a bit more space. Bex, thank you very much. Lily, I'm gonna ask you one final thing. Have you changed your thinking about things or your lifestyle, do you think, in any way permanently as a result of the pandemic? Mm, that's a good question. I was wondering what you're gonna say as a result of. <laughs> um, <laughs> first, before I answer that, one thing just to, Bex, I really enjoyed what you said initially about making the environment part of the economy, and that is actually the thinking almost everybody I interviewed for the book from whatever different ideological positions they came from um, tended pretty much, I think literally everyone said in the end, they thought carbon taxes or pollution taxes is critical because if you make the, if you, that's a kind of tangible way of making the environment part of the economy and then you can still have a functioning economy. It would just shift in, in how it's, how it's running slightly. Um, and I was thinking that at the beginning of the conversation, James, when you were talking about the needs, the need to like get the economy going post COVID, and kind of balancing that with the environmental situation and in my mind they shouldn't be seen as these like two opposing forces which is like you can only have the economy or you can have the environment it's like no we just need to think about how we're running and designing the economy um, in a way that's holistic or more holistic to the environment and that is very possible um so sorry i just had to wanted to throw that in in terms of have i changed in any way post um yeah, I think I'm going to take a lot. I'm just going to travel a lot less. Um, mm -hmm. And I was already traveling um, a lot less. Uh, as I write about in the book, I've been trying to reduce my footprint massively. And it just kind of went like, an, obviously, the complete lockdown where you stop taking. I used to be, I live outside London. I used to be taking the train to London at least two or three times a week. And that's completely stopped. And I've really enjoyed not doing that um, mm -hmm. and being able to be a bit more grounded and still in one place. Um, and actually realizing that you can work from home and you can do lots of Zoom calls. So that is something that I hope and plan to, to keep in my life. All right. Well, listen, thank, th Lily, thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, for, for joining us this evening. It's a very funny thing, actually, in the course of this hour talking to you and actually processing what I thought reading the book, which I think comes out at the end of the month. Who cares wins, doesn't it? It comes out at the end of the yeah. month. Um, was there's a very strange thing if you're a journalist, is that as much as you spend your life learning and reporting about the complexities of life, your urges for simplicities of things that are right versus things that are wrong. And one of the things that I'm struck by just listening to you is something beyond what you say and how you say it. Because, you know, people will agree or disagree with universal basic income. People have views on carbon pricing. People will want to digest what they think about conscious consumerism or you know, um, oversight of the internet. But what's really, really, you know, striking, Lily, is this, is this combination of saying, oh, I'm gonna just do my little bit in contributing to this conversation, or saying, look, I, my approach to this is, a, is optimistic, as you say in the book, because actually that's more likely to promote some kind of action. And most of all, I'm really struck by the fact that you've approached this subject and chosen deliberately to be non-ideological. And so the combination of something that's optimistic, um, a mixture of optimism and humility is really uh, one that I will take away and try to make sure that we uh, uh, use and, and adopt in our journalism too. So thank you very much for 
for sharing this time with, with us and for talking about Who Cares Wins. Thank you everyone for weighing in both in the conversation uh, and in the chat. Um, we can't say thank you to Lily. We couldn't because she wouldn't come in on the train to join us anyway. So all we could do is uh, give her a, a happy wave off. Uh, thanks. Have a very good evening. Uh, do head out to the trampoline. <laughs> thank you guys. Thanks so much. Thanks Bye. a lot.